talk to each other again. Are there any um, questions about the reading, last week's lecture, current events as they relate to what we'll be talking about? Are Not that you... They aren't you mean on... Um, let's see. There are physical copies in my office, but you would have to go get them. And did anybody, uh, actually from last Wednesday, if you gave me your L number and all that kind of stuff, to re-give me that, because that piece of paper got spaced. So, and if anybody wants in, L, name and L number. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I hope so. I know people are having trouble dropping things as of yesterday. It's almost like it was a denial of service attack, but hopefully it wasn't that. Thank you. Okay. Ain't it the first? Yes. Well, oriented times three. Oh, let's turn on the display. That would help. Okay. Um, so how's the read? Yes, go ahead. Um, you said something last week along the lines of like, knowledge is power and that quote came from Africa. I'm just wondering like the exact wordage of that quote. Well, there's several of them. Yeah. Um, Fanon said, uh, mastery of language affords incredible power. Now, Fanon, so, so there, yeah, there are lots of different quotes along those lines. So Fanon, uh, who will, we don't study formally until third term, though I will mention him now and also the construct that I'm going to give you today, um, was a, a, a psychiatrist, black psychiatrist, originally from the island of Martinique, um, educated at the Sorbonne, did his internship in Algeria in a mental hospital, and coined the phrase sociostructural violence. So what sociostructural violence is, is um, you know, basically, according to him, is we are conditioned by the educational system, the educational system he was part of, to think of violence as individual to individual, but not systems against individuals. It's like you've been educated to not think of it that way, even though the body count is systems against individuals. 
right? So he coined the term socio-structural violence. That is, structures in society commit violence against people. And how he observes that is he's a fully trained psychiatrist and he's working in a mental hospital in Algeria when Algeria was a French colony and you have then Africans and you have Europeans with the same psych diagnosis. The white folks are getting drugs and talk therapy and the black folks are getting tortured as part of therapy. Uh, wait, same diagnosis? <laughs> why is this? Why is there a racial bifurcation? And why do you think that's normal? Oh, boom. You think that's normal. You think that's normal. Right. <laughs> and that's the problem. You've been educated to think that way. And so, therefore, for example, we'll learn about another form of socio-structural violence. What, what time was he alive? Or is he dead? Uh, early 20th century. And what was the quote again? Um... Mastery of language affords incredible power. Okay? So let's see here. See, we're not getting signal from that. Let's go direct. Let's see what that does. So you can see what I see. True. Could do it the old fashioned way. Huh. Okay, good. Now they're talking to each other. Excellent. All right, so Malefe Asante, if you've re done the reading in uh, the history of Africa, one of the things he talks about uh, in terms of African origins is that we're starting with the people that he's quoting that is in your extra uh, credit assignment where it's like Sheikh Anta Diop, among others, where, that's, where Sheikh Anta Diop is placed in history, the 1950s, this is when Africa, I'm going to make a startling statement. One good thing you can say about Hitler. One. Hitler engaged all the European powers in a war that caused, when in defeating him, the effort caused in defeating him basically meant they no longer had energy for their African colonies or any of their colonies anywhere. And so that's when you started seeing liberation movements. Immediately post-war. It's almost as if, great, colonizers are gone. They're like basically rebuilding their countries from war. We get to now do our own scholarship independent of them. And that's when you start seeing all this stuff. Uh, independence movements launched in Africa and other places around the world that were under, that were colonies in Europe. One good thing you can say about Hitler. He made that possible. Not much else good you can say about it. So part of that movement is you get people like Sheikh Anta Diop saying, uh, hey, not only are we, you know, did humanity start here in Africa, but we're also the cradle of civilization. And let's look at how far that is, and let's actually start thinking for ourselves and look doing our own research. Hey, we got this great education from Europeans. Cool. Let's start writing the story from our point of view. 
because you know, what you know, M Malefe will talk tell you, and he gave an example of that in the reading was that if you're coming from a certain lens that says, "Oh, we're the best, we're the brightest, and all you other people are, you know, below us and inferior, and the best that you can aspire to be is like us," uh, well, <coughs> wait, we're using Arabic numbers. That did not come from Europe. You don't balance your checkbook using Roman numerals. The Romans didn't have <laughs> uh, well, a lot of things that came out of Africa. So one of the things that when he's talking about the three things that generate African culture. okay, And he's saying, okay, the three generators. And he's saying, okay, this is where you get power, which gets to your original question about, well, what is power? So, and what is history? You know, mastery of language affords incredible power. Uh, <coughs> history, memory to a person is like history to a people, or history to people is like memory to a person. Okay, but what is history? All right, within that reading, he talked about do you believe that humanity all originated from one place or many places? Because they're both theories. Polyge uh, poly, um, polygenesis, monogenesis. Uh, one, one source, many sources. The scientific evidence, according to Western-based science, is Africa. One place. Other folks saying, oh, no, we were born in Panther Meadow, Mount Shasta. We came out of, you know, hope, you know, Four Corners area, Hopi Land, or wherever you, your folks say you came from. Something interesting from Luzia in mm -hmm. the last class, they said that Luzia was very similar to people in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Australia. Yeah. So that kind of lends a bit of credit to the maybe it's a poly, but maybe it's a poly mono. Yeah. Well, f for example, if you look, and I'll, I have a slide that, we, that talks about that, if you trace by mitochondrial DNA, then you can trace human migration out of Africa, going into India, thence into Australia, and then over to here, up into Europe, and then over to here, using mitochondrial DNA, which you got from your mom, and tracing the oldest branches. Now, that's a piece of evidence, but, you know, who believes in that, necessarily? That's not biblical, if that's what you believe in. That's not Quranic, that's not in the Torah. I mean, if you believe the Bible, there were disasters that happened. Yeah, there were. And science does tell us that there were disasters that happened. There were disasters that happened, yeah. So, as an example... You know, when we talk about climate change and the whole argument about whether humans are creating it or not, the Sahara was a rainforest. Okay? I mean, that's what he's talking about. So, and I can show you, you know, cave art from that time when it was, they're basically depicting hunting hippos in the Sahara, which meant there's like water to support hippos. So when he talks about the three generators, the green Sahara, the rainforest home, and the Great Rift Valley, and of course, iron. So uh, the idea about the difference between inner stand, over stand, and understand, which is a reference in hip hop, but inner stand means you understand it from the ground level in your heart, all right? So this is the same, uh, this is basically a, a rainforest in uh, Ghana. It's a baby banyan tree, because the big banyan tree is way bigger than this, so that's pretty old, you know, by itself, easy to century. That's at the ground level. Understand, oh, well, I'm in a rainforest, and that's treetop level. And that, so when you're in a rainforest, you can see there's lots of plants, lots of, you know, lots of plants, lots of animals. I, I can eat this, I can't eat that. This is a medicine, this is a poison. And it would take you a number of uh, years to discover that, or maybe not. You know, in our current conception, 
the Western conceptual framework of how did Native Americans, for example, know that there's 800 medicinal plants, of which we're still using 80. Did somebody do, uh, you know, like for example, uh, you walk the butte, and there's blackberries and there's poison oak. Both of them have three leaves. How do you tell the difference? Leaflet three, let it be, doesn't work if they both have three leaves. And you better know the difference, yes? You don't want to eat a blackberry leaf or a poison oak leaf mistaking it for blackberry. Not fun. Don't try that at home, kids. All right? So within the culture, the belief is the plants told us. Now in Western, no, we, you can't talk to plants. Right. The, the plants told us what's good for us. Yes? Is it just like a thinning of population from the ones in the forget? Like, I mean, was it like the same rainforest, or was it just a totally new thing to them, and there was a trial and error? And kind of they, uh, well, what happened in the Sahara, basically, climate change changed the Sahara. It started drying up. And so they went further south. To places like this, right, and then east and other places. Was it different? It was different, like totally different rainforests. Or was it, like uh, it was very similar. very similar. Yeah. Because you know, I I've been in that forest when it's raining, and it's not like the torrential downpour in Eugene. It literally is like he described in the book. You know, like the canopy, and you know, the next slide will show you this. Overstand, understand, understand, overstand. So that's looking down into the canopy. Which, you know, if you see that central hole, the ground, you can actually see the ground, but it doesn't show up in the photograph because I didn't want to enhance, you know, didn't want to mess with the photograph too much. But it's, um, it's basically on a suspension bridge over the rainforest. So there's three positions you can take in terms of understanding a lot of this material. What, how it affects you emotionally, how it affects you intellectually, and how it affects you beyond uh, your own personal personality. Overstand. So for example, in Algeria, what's now modern Algeria, uh, the Cave Art of Tassili. So when they talk about, for example, there's a Steely Dan song called The Caves of Altamira. In the Caves of Altamira, there are basically people hunting bison. And that's usually some of the earliest cave art that is basically talked about. And when you see you know, the history of Western civilization, they talk about Lascaux and Altamira in Spain or you know, Lascaux in France. Well, these are older. And there's more of them all throughout Africa, as Asante basically tells us. So why aren't they using that as a history of civilization? They don't, all right? So a Sahara that we wouldn't recognize today because of our idea. So the Tisili wall paintings show a picture that we would not recognize. Instead of vast gravel plains and lakes of sand, there are highly realistic scenes of people harvesting fruit of date palms, a village with a herd of cattle, people defending their flock of sheep from a lion attack and scenes of religious ceremonies. Some of the earliest carvings are at least 8,000 years old or more. It's hard to date. I mean, and Malet Asante gives you that range, like 50,000 years. Uh, <laughs> we can make a case for that. That's definitely Homo sapiens. So even if we say the cradle of civilization is 12,000, uh, that's kind of stretching it. It might be farther back, like 50. But it's easy, if it's easier to believe 12, OK. Yeah. If we get rid of the notion that civilization is the way we're organized currently, yeah. right. we can go farther back than even that. Yes. We can go straight to 200,000. You could, because one of the things he talks about is, all oh, right, what is civilization? Is it language? What sets up language? Like the critters, the hominid critters, that came before us had tool making. 
stones, right? And could organize hunting. So if we think about, like your writing class might teach you to think about, writing is thinking. So thinking becomes speech. And what becomes one of the first things you study? So Asante says, uh, a woman in pregnancy. That's one of the first scientific things you're going to observe. How the baby get there? How's the baby growing? How does labor happen? How do you develop midwives? How do you know what transition is? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to believe people just stumble through 100,000 years. Well, yeah, right. Just better get it right. Huh? How do you do breech births? Uh, right. <laughs> I mean, I, my kids were born at home. Water births. Uh, right. But study up on the technology of how you do that. Why would you do that? Now it's like standard. But I mean, think about, you know, basic problems that humans have to be, you have to have a way of not only thinking about it, but communicating with other people to build a civilization. And that's even before an alphabet. Hey, we have people coming to this college today that are learning to read from the first time and they're like 70. You know, that's rare, but it does happen. It has happened in the years that I've been here. All right? How do you get along? Well, red light, red means stop and green means go and yellow means go faster. No. <laughs> All right, so again, we, ha we run into this, uh, <laughs> this conflict of how old is humanity? 6,000-year-old wooden canoe found in northeastern Nigeria, finds that wooden artifacts are rare, but the once wet wetter climate of the region since turned to semi-desert, and the dryness has helped pre prevent the wood from rotting. Now, we're still looking at the idea of archaeology being physical objects rather than the stories, because we don't have the stories. Or if we do have the stories, the stories have been changed over time. So I already told you this, 10,000 years ago in West Africa, you could also say 12, maybe more. <coughs> So artist conceptions, I had to search for artist conceptions, and this is basically one of the things where when you're dealing with any technology, it reflects the culture of the folks that generated it. So out of Africa, say 1.2 to 2 million years ago, habilis. This is where we get the word habilitate. So homo habilis. Definitely the hominids, handyman. There are two types of Homo habilis, large and small. The small had a 500 to 650 milligram milliliter brain cap and a more ape-like body. And the large is 600 to 800 milliliter brain cap, brain capacity. So. Already, we are basically saying it's brain size that makes humans better than other critters. It's a human-centric assumption. But, okay, that's what we have to work with, so fine. The evidence seems to fit the story. So... And they are actually could be possibly variations on one creature. So no hair. According to the gene that controls dark skin color, the last change was about 1.2 million years ago. So if you've ever, you know, shaved your pets for the vet, you notice that their skin is a different color than some of the, what's under the fur, polar bears, et cetera, et cetera. So and they've also actually done things on body lice. Body lice inhabit clothing, not skin. So you have to have clothing for body lice to inhabit them. And then you study the genomes of body lice, and that gives you a date, too. But we're tracking their, their, their basically, their, they don't have hair. And tool making for a purpose and language. 
may be fire. Because of what they found around the skeletons that they found. So tools, stone tool making, tools from animal bones, and clothing. Okay, that's habilis. Habilitate, not only to make tools, but to clothe. So, you know, when we talk, you know, I'm a drug counselor, so we deal with rehab. Well, if you didn't habilitate people in the first place, you can't be talking about rehabilitation because you didn't habilitate them for that specific narrow range of, like, addiction. So we get that word from homo habilis, handyman. Then, Homo erectus. So below the neck, erect Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are identical. And Homo erectus would have been